Hello again. In this video, I'm going to be covering Chapter 2 of Surveys Pink Air's The Sources of Christian Ethics. Um, if you haven't seen uh, the review, the summary of Chapter 1, you can watch that um, first. This is uh, going to be Chapter 2. This is uh, Chapter 2 is uh, a bit longer than Chapter 1, so this I'll try to keep the video short. Um, but he goes a little bit more in depth here in Chapter 2, and uh, I'm just going to jump go ahead and jump right into it. So um, <clears throat> at the very beginning, uh, he kind of gives a little dis little bit of a disclaimer. He's this this chapter is what he's going to cover um, throughout the course of the book. He's going to give little summaries as we go through this chapter. Um, he kind of describes the chapter uh, with a metaphor, uh, as a, a hiker on the top of the hill describing the terrain to a friend. Um, so he's not going to cover everything. He doesn't claim to um, <clears throat> be comprehensive in this chapter. Um, um, but he gives, I think, eight points um, that he's going to cover throughout the chapter, which will be uh, um, expanded throughout the rest of the book. So he's going to cover he's going to cover first moral obligation, which we talked about extensively in the first chapter. He's going to talk about the question of happiness, which we talked about also in the first chapter. He'll go on to life's meaning and goal, um, uh, questions about suffering. He'll talk about love truth, justice, and sin. Um, these are the subcategories of this chapter which we will cover today. So let's jump in. First, um, questions about moral obligation. So we kind of ask what role does obligation play in ethics? Um, and he kind of goes on to say that for many for many, uh, especially uh, contemporary ethicists, the question of moral obligation circumscribes the study of moral ethics. Um, some ethicists prioritize justice over love, identifying man as a law-oriented animal. Um, so the question of justice, which we'll get to later, um, and the question of moral obligation is the central uh, concern, and everything else, um, the question of happiness, love, desire, things like this are all um, secondary considerations behind the question of moral obligation. Um, in the past 500 years or so, many saints have lived with this kind of understanding, this very mm, juridical uh, consideration, uh, understanding of moral ethics. But he says that any saint has been pushed beyond this um, by a certain spiritual impulse. And uh, that's going to be important in this chapter. He talks about impulse or a uh, kind of um, spontaneity. He uses the word spontaneity a lot when describing desire and love, which is really important for him. Um, going on to the question of happiness. So uh, St. Thomas deals with law in the Summa, but for him, law is by its very nature closer to the mind than to the will. And ethics, of course, has more to do with the will than it does with the mind. For St. Thomas, the question of happiness is the center of his treatment of moral theology. So, um, just as we said before in chapter 1, the question of happiness is, is very central, according to Pinkers and according to um, Thomas. You'll see that Pinkers is very Thomistic um, almost all the way through, with a few exceptions. Um, this question of happiness is central to Aquinas. It's also central to Aristotle and Augustine, um, specifically. So it's the question of happiness is important for the ancients as well as for the medievals. Um, so he, he kind of identifies this obligation-centered system as particularly modern. Um, he quotes Augustine from The City of God. A person engages in philosophy only in order to be happy. So the question of happiness applies not only to morals, but to philosophy too. And in fact, everything in the spiritual life, everything in the Christian life. Um, so he kind of presents two great mo models of moral thought that we that are open to modern people. The first is ancient, this qu which focuses on human happiness, and um, and its attainment, uh, happiness, attaining happiness through the theological and cardinal virtues. Um, 
And then there's also the contemporary option, which focuses on obligations and compliance thereof through the commandments. Okay? Two important ideas that are going to continue through the rest of this chapter. The question of happiness and the question of obligation, or the, the perspectives of both of these. Okay? Um, Pink Harris uses a, a friendship as an example of something that was lost in the shift from that old ancient idea to the contemporary one. And then courage as another. Um, when you're thinking about moral um, ethics in terms of obligation, the question of friendship comes up only peripherally uh, and similarly with courage. But when you consider moral ethics as a pursuit of true happiness, um, friendship, which, like for example, Aristotle um, considers essential, it becomes a central question. Um, friendship, as does courage, um, courage to so the being able to remain faithful and, and strong in your faith is central to the question of happiness, but not to uh, the question of uh, obligation. Okay. Um, the adherents of an obligatory sense of morality also lose scriptural roots and foundation. So when you read the Gospels and the Fathers and the Medievals, um, in many cases, um, they're, they're just written with uh, scriptural quotations and references because scripture is concerned with human happiness as well. Um, as we get to more modern and contemporary uh, writers on ethics, you lose scripture references. It becomes very dry um, uh, rational and non-scriptural. Since Kant, I'm quoting now from page 20, since Kant, moral systems viewing human happiness as a goal have been suspected of hedonism. So, um, there's a, the, you know, Kant had an idea that if, if you're only concerned with human happiness, you're going to be self-centered, just de facto. Um, but to answer this objection, Pink Harris appeals to different types of love, right? So the pursuit of happiness with base loves, so low loves, passions, right, um, will turn into hedonism. It, that's true. But if agape and philia are possible in man, agape being like the love of God and philia, the love of friends, um, the friendship and, and brotherhood, right? If these are possible in man, the pursuit of happiness can lead to beatitude, not just simply hedonism, but it can lead to beatitude. So pink airs, Thomas, Aristotle, uh, Augustine, have a higher view of what man is capable of in his loves, right? Of course, Christians understand that as being perfected by grace. The moral theory of beatitude, this is page 22, the moral the theory of beatitude, if properly understood, can perfectly well include the question of obligation and accord the commandments a fitting role within its structure. So Pinkers doesn't want to just dispense with the idea of obligation and moral theology. In fact, he says that there, you can't make sense of moral theology without uh, the question of obligation. But it needs to be contextualized in a greater discussion of happiness and love. We'll get into. Um, so he wants to recontextualize it, not dispense with it. So that's good. Um, he he said he he identifies Christian ethics as the science of happiness. So it's kind of a, a reworking of the definition, right? Uh, he says teachers and preachers' first priority, therefore, is to teach the beatitudes, the kingdom of God, etc., not moral obligations, which come after. Uh, going on to the third point: life's meaning and goal. Uh, Picker says that man's life has meaning only when it is directed toward a goal. And he, um, he, he quotes several sources that support this claim. Um, individual events, then, must also be understood in light of this direction. So we talked a little bit in, in chapter one about um, moderns, contemporary uh, ethicists being too discreet in human acts. And Pink Harris wants to be more, uh, wants to look more at dispositions and intentions, kind of a wide sweeping underlying uh, uh, attitudes that people have that undergird their actions. And this is coming up again here. Um, Pink Harris wants to look at uh, um, the, the end of life, the goal of life, and understand individual events within this context. Um, 
He says that happiness is the sum of all goods and the goal of all goals. So happiness is the end of life for Pinkeris, right? Moral ethicists oriented to the end of life, which takes intention into account, which takes intention into account, gives a more accurate view of man who can accord with the teachings of the law with false intentions. And he, he um, offers a little example of a man who goes to mass simply um, because it, it, it uh, has the potential for furthering a business opportunity and uh, a sister, a nun who goes to mass with the intention of fulfilling her, uh, of, of receiving the grace of God in the sacrament, right? So you can do a good thing with a bad intention and this is something that is uh, glossed over potentially or ignored in modern ethicists. Um, the meaning of life is important. Everyone cares about what their life means. So if you use that as the goal, the orientation for um, moral ethics, it's going to be more attractive and appealing and make more sense to people, right? Um, the work of the ethicist and the priest will be to help every Christian to respond personally to the question of the real meaning of life. Again, people don't want to hear about what you ought and oughtn't do uh, just because you ought and oughtn't do them because God says. But when you orient the discussion around the meaning of a person's life, what makes you happy, uh, the work of the ethicist and the priest to become more effective and more meaningful. It makes more sense. That's page 24. On to the fourth point, suffering. This is huge. The question of suffering is central to the gospel's moral teaching. Take up your cross. Uh, blessed are the poor, the hungry, thirsty, mourners, etc. Right. So he quotes several gospel passages um, which centralize suffering. Suffering presents man with a choice between despair and gospel hope. So he talks about how suffering is like the tangible... Uh, encounter that a person has with the problem of evil, which is sort of abstract. And when you encounter suffering in your life, you're faced with a choice. You can either despair or you can fall back on the hope, the gospel hope, right? The good news. Um, so this, this, the, the question of suffering, which again is not central in a, in a consideration of moral obligation. You just should do what you should or should you should just do what you should do. And the question of suffering is peripheral. It doesn't, you know, it's, it, it might provide the context for, for um, a moral obligation, but it's not central to the question. But again, suffering butts right up against the question of happiness. It is, it's, it's a really important part of the question when you look at it from the perspective of happiness, right? The obligation moral theory is the result of a rationalistic conception of the human person. In this conception, reason and will dominate. This is where morality resides, reason and will. And below these lie affectivity, so desires, love, suffering, etc. These, therefore, are only indirectly related to morality and are relegated to a secondary status. That's a paraphrase from page 26, right? Um, cr uh, obligation also ignores spiritual sensibility, he says, or uh, relegates it to uh, mysticism, which is an unrelated field of, of study. So here again, we have spiritual sensibility. This keeps coming back, this idea of um, a kind of spontaneity or uh, intuition, an instinct or a spiritual sensibility that, that exists in man. Um, Kant or other modern ethicists would kind of view man, I think, as, a, as a, an inert agent that is presented with... Uh, moral choices that he must just decide the good right but according you know according to um uh, a biblical and um a biblical worldview man is not an inert actor he actually has a, there's a spontaneous draw to the good he has desires and um a, he has spiritual sensibilities which which draw him in a certain direction and that has to be factored into the question of moral ethics. Um, it's really important that this comes back over and over again, this kind of spont spontaneity that he talks about. Um, going on to the fifth point, love. So there's this classic theological formula, charity is the form of the virtues. And everybody says this, everybody claims this. Um, uh, he quotes, he kind of paraphrases Augustine here, charity is the root of all virtues. 
even the cardinal ones. Um, and uh, he, he talks about how St. Augustine is responsible for really revolutionizing moral theory for Christians. He takes these cardinal virtues, fortitude, justice, prudence, temperance, and he contextualized the, contextualizes all of those in terms of charity, as forms of charity, right? So he, he establishes this theological virtue, charity, as the root of all the virtues, including these kind of... Uh, uh, these cardinal virtues, which are not strictly like Christian virtues, right? Um, for St. Thomas, the act of loving is the first movement of the will. Um, so most moderns won't deny this. Uh, but uh, he says, do we love out of obedience or obey out of love? Sometimes it seems that modern ethicists will kind of um, make obedience, you know, to the to the law, uh, a a priority, and then the the command to love thy neighbor comes out comes second to that obedience, right? And uh, Saint Thomas disagrees with this. He thinks there's a there's a, the first movement of the will is to love, and uh, so loving charity is primary, and obedience comes out of love because you love you obey. This is really important um, because oftentimes contemporaries will reverse that the order there. Um, here is that spontaneity again. There is an inner spontaneity that impels us through love toward the good, right? So we're compelled toward the good toward the good by our very nature. This is so important for Pinkeris for Thomas, of course, as well. Love, being the root of desire, is directly linked to happiness. Um, and charity also addresses questions of hope. So uh, uh, thinking about happiness as our final end, happiness as the orientation of the discussion of ethics, love is the root of desire, and it's so, so therefore it is directly, it's intrinsically linked to happiness, right? Love and happiness are inseparable. Um, so this kind of gives context to Augustine's famous quote, love and do what you will, right? Um, and here we have to discuss uh, another modern move that's particularly more recent, I think, um, which is a, a, a reaction against Kantian legalism, um, a pushing against this idea of obligation, um, and it's a radical shift toward love at all costs, where love is extolled on all sides, but any reference to sacrifice and renunciation is unacceptable. So I think you see that a lot today. Um, reaction against legalism, um, as long as you have fuzzy feelings, um, you're doing it right, so to speak. There's no quest, There's no uh, consideration of, like he says, sacrifice or suffering or renunciation or repentance, things like this. There's no room for that. And this is also a contemporary battle we have to fight, right? Um, on the contrary, right, human love is built, is built on sacrifice. He talks about how um, uh, a moral life that has no suffering, that has no sacrifice in it, isn't but that's it's not even a, a moral life at all is this even a person he says um uh so then the question of uh god's love and justice comes up this is a huge problem um how to reconcile god's justice and his love um and he kind of hints at an answer he's going to talk about this later the answer being mercy right the the um love of jesus christ sacrificing himself for the salvation of of us sinners um, I remember once I was reading this article about, it was like a history of the ontological argument for God's existence, um, and um, a great article outlined, you know, um, the history from Anselm through uh, uh, Aquinas and then into the moderns and such. Uh, I learned a lot, but at the very end, the, uh, the authors felt the need to say, in a totally unrelated note, not related at all to the ontological argument, since God's love and justice contradict each other, God can't exist. So it was like a little, <laughs> by the way, we're atheists. We don't, you know, it, so that was kind of weird to me um, that they would just kind of throw that into the end and to just kind of, it was kind of like almost a dismissal of the whole article. Um, and this is a big question. I mean, certainly it's, it's a big question, but it's only really a, a big problem when you have this modern conception of, uh, of, of moral obligation. 
and um, justice isn't contextualized into love, but it's di it's a dichotomy, and these things these two things are opposed. Right. Let's see here. Um, so in the question in further in this question of love, which is the longest section in this chapter, he he goes into a consideration of beauty. Um, Beauty is actually the first and specific source of love, according to St. Thomas. That's page 30. Um, this is something we've definitely lost today. And, you know, thanks to, like, the work of um, Bishop Barron, for example, uh, consideration of beauty that's central is, is returning, I believe. Um, the beautiful differs from the good only in its notion, says St. Thomas, as from the Summa. Um, so the beautiful and the good are... are nearly identical, only differ in notion. St. Basil the Great says, the beauty of God is the first cause of our love. So the love, goodness, and beauty of God shining through Jesus Christ, these were the wellsprings of the dynamism of the Christian life for the fathers of the church. Uh, this is like page 31 of the book. Love, goodness, and beauty of God shining through Jesus Christ, these were the wellsprings of the dynamism of the Christian life for the fathers, right? Beauty is central to consideration. It's so related to the question of happiness, the question of charity, right? Um, then he goes, he speculates, is the loss of beauty in religious art, architecture, and music, <sighs> tell me about it, due to the loss of beauty in moral theology? Modern ethicists don't know how beauty relates to obligations, right? Again, when you're, when you're looking at moral ethics in terms of strictly obli obligations there's no room there's no obvious place to put like considerations of beauty for example so you lose it and then he speculates does that lead then to the loss of beauty in religious art architecture and music which certainly has happened that's undeniable right um he talks about mysticism too mysticism has been excluded from a consideration of charity and then and so it uh, and he thinks it ought to be reincorporated um, so here we see where Pinker is, um, uh, is identifying where modern ethicists have removed the considerations of other areas of theology from moral theology. At the very beginning of the book, he talked about how moral theology had kind of developed on its own with its own jargon and its own uh, considerations here. And then other, uh, other theology, other subsets of theology developed uh, independently. Right? So you have these two things. He wants these to be all incorporated into one body of study, namely theology. Um, and, uh, yeah, because of that, you've stripped away a lot of the things that inform moral theology. And here he identifies beauty um, and mysticism. And uh, to be fair to modern uh, ethicists, uh, they don't dispense with a lot of these things. They don't dispense with charity with mysticism, etc., they just relegate them to a different study, d different theological considerations. Um, oftentimes, they do that, um, but, but then we lose all of those those sources of understanding when we consider moral ethics. Um, the final part of this uh, of this section on love uh, has to do with relationships. Some moderns have viewed all relationships as fundamentally hostile because of the self interestedness of the of the people involved, right? Of the of the of the relating people. Um, this leaves no room for love and should be done away with, he says. So, uh, almost a might we say a Darwinian like view of relationships. Um, uh, that's al always in conflict. The people are always in conflict um, with each other. Uh, he 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 thinks this needs to be done away with. And it leaves no, because it leaves no room for love. Next, he goes on to a consideration of truth. He says, similarly, similarly, truth has been separated out and dealt with in ethics only as regards matters of dogma, which the faith demands we assent to. That's page 33. So, um, yeah, truth. The church demands that we believe the dogmas, in the dogmas of the church, and this becomes the only uh really relevant area that truth comes in the consideration of moral theology, which obviously is, is, is frightening and, and not, not good. Whereas Descartes 
whereas Descartes' methodological procedure was by way of doubt and dealing only in ideas, biblical truth engages the whole person, he says on page 34. Um, mind is not now abstract reason, but intelligence united to will, love and desire, informing and directing them. Okay, So he wants um, truth, which engages the mind, to be brought in to the discussion of moral ethics. Um, truth culminates in the gift of wisdom, which perfects charity, and the gift of understanding, which perfects faith. So truth culminates in the gift of wisdom, which perfects charity, and the gift of understanding, which perfects faith. That's truth being brought into this consideration. Finally, the contemplative dimension um, must be restored to Christian ethics, which has become profoundly voluntaristic in recent centuries. The contemplative dimension uh, must be restored. Finally, not not finally, we have another uh, consideration. There's, there are two more uh, sub-points here. Justice is the next. Today, um, many ethicists are overly concerned with commutative justice and not general justice. So justice has concerns like crime, like a... Uh, uh, what you think of it as courtroom justice, right? Justice and love, according to Pinkers, form one unique entity. Justice emphasizes the righteousness of love, while love stresses the profound spontaneity that attracts people to one another. It's page 36. Um, so there we have justice and love being fused together to form one unique en entity. He doesn't want them to be uh, opposed to each other. He thinks they're one. Um, with justice emphasizing the righteousness of love. Um, so justice, here's one of the places where I think Pink Ayers diverges a little bit from, from uh, Thomas's position, and he goes a more Augustinian route. Um, he kind of lays out this uh, little map for us. Plato defined interior justice as harmony among uh, a person's faculties. Uh, Augustine takes this theme, and says that submission of a person's rational powers to God becomes the condition for mastery of the senses. So, uh, so Augustine takes maybe like a Neoplatonic line, and and is thinks that there is such a thing as like internal justice within a person. Aristotle, on the other hand, situated an understanding of justice in a social context, so thereby placing justice um, outside the person and into relations with other people. And uh, Aquinas takes Aristotle's line. Um, law becomes justice's objective measure. Justice, therefore, is always concerned with law and is therefore always at least a little juridical. Um, and Pinkeris thinks there's room for an incorporation of Augustinian justice, a kind of internal justice, which um, you know harmonizes a person's faculties and sort of uh, allows them to be transformed by God's mercy. Um, for all of these, however, justice, for all of these four, Plato, Augustine, Aristotle, and Aquinas, justice is a virtue, right? Its desire to give to others makes it kind of like friendship. Um, St. Thomas sees justice as a necessary prerequisite for charity, but for Augustine, these two are more closely linked. So St. Thomas sees justice as a prerequisite for charity. It leads you to charity, just like the old law leads to the new. Um, but for Augustine, these two are more closely linked together. Justice and charity are more, in fact, that one entity we talked about. Uh, so in this area, pink ears might be more Augustinian than Thomistic. In contrast, however, the modern era is characterized by its subjective conception of rights, as formulated by 14th century nominalism. That's on page 38. So the direction of what is owed is reversed. What do others owe me, he says. So before, justice is a consideration of like what, what is owed to others. What, what can I give to others? Um, that's what makes it akin to friendship for St. Thomas. But that direction is reversed in the modern era. Um, and then you have a consideration. And then you have things like individual rights, right? Uh, a, a demand for, for my rights. So justice becomes no longer a charity-linked power of the soul, uh, but it concentrates, it concentrates on the defense of external rights. Right? After, justice, after justice is pitted against charity, words like charity, mercy, um, etc., words of love, become devalued. Now charity just simply means 
giving to a charity organization or giving to the poor, and it, it no longer has a central meaning in modern life, right? Um, Pink Harris thinks that the sources of justice are threefold. First of all, justice comes from God, right? And is shown forth in God's law and in, and also in God's loving, uh, righteous love, his mercy, uh, uh, of course, culminating in the sacrifice of love of Jesus Christ. Secondly, uh, justice comes from the human heart. Um, and thirdly, it comes from civil society. And these are hierarchical listings. These are God first, which flows into the human heart and in his relationships, and then finally into civil society, which is a collection of individuals, right? Moral justice is rooted in theological justice, he finishes that section with. It's rooted in theological justice. Again, God is the first, is the first source of justice. Um, finally, the last section is sin. Sin has taken pride of place in moral manuals, replacing virtues. Um, the morality of sin or prohibitions, he says. This is page 40. If in the last century, that's the 1800s for him, people thought that we were all basically good and that the progress of human sciences would ensure the solution of most of our moral problems, today we are more inclined to think that with the collapse of scientific optimism, no one can avoid a guilt complex. So in the 19th century, there are scientific optimists who believe that, you know, uh, that the human race is improving with, with, the sci with scientific progress. Um, after the world wars, you can't really think that anymore. And so people are more likely to, <laughs> he says, no one can avoid a guilt complex. Um, sin is a huge common experience, but to make it the central subject of uh, study is a mistake, he thinks. Most moral manuals um, are, you know, these are the sins that you have to avoid, and, they, and that's really the, the meat, the center of the, of the consideration. He says this is wrong. In the Gospels, sin is the reason for Jesus' coming, yes, but grace is kind of the main character, he says. By its very enormity, sin points to a superabundance of grace, on page 41. Uh, he says, the theologian who pays more attention to sin than to grace is like someone who puts out a light in order to peer into a dark recess. So he wants grace to be the way by which we understand sin, and he thinks too many people ignore grace and, and peer into the, the darkness um, by turning out that light, so to speak. Um, grace needs to become the center of moral theology once again. Sin should be viewed less as discrete actions um, and more like a rejection of the light, lying, uh, envy, uh, or surrender to Satan. So again, here's a, an idea that, that's, that sin is simply, here's an inert agent. Uh, the, the, the moral person is an inert agent. And when he sins, he's, he's sinning. He, there are discrete actions against justice or love. Um, but Pinkeris thinks that uh, sin is more like, and this is patristic too. Sin is like a disease. It's like a, it's like a, a disposition. Um, it's not discrete actions, although it manifests itself in discrete actions. The the there's an underlying attitude or disposition uh, or disease um, that that causes a person to commit discrete sinful actions, right? Um, he quotes Matthew fifteen. For from the heart come evil intentions, right? From a person's innermost parts. That's page 42. Um, Augustine delineates two types of love. Love of God and neighbor, which is open and free, right? Love God with your whole heart, mind, soul, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is a, a, a love that opens you up to the world, to reality. And then there's the love of self, which is closed off and exclusive and uh, self-referential. Um, sin's root lies in turning in upon oneself, he says on page 42, I believe. Uh, he quotes Pascal, who says, the ego is hateful, right? So we need to get rid of this ego, this self-centered type of love. But then he goes on to, um, to be a little bit, to make a little bit more of a distinction. There are two types of self-love. There's the first, the natural love of self, which is that spontaneous, God-given love of self. 
um, God commands, after all, to love your neighbor as yourself. You need to, there, there's a certain um, righteous love of self that we need to have. Aquinas says that natural self-love is the foundation of charity and friendship. So you can't love others unless you love yourself in, a, in an ordered way. Um, this self-love, this righteous self-love, though, is always tainted by egoism or pride, right? Um, on page 43, he says, Egoism is the most natural of all parasites because it feeds on the spontaneous love that images God. It is the most natural of all parasites so egoism, or this disordered self-love, is the thing that, is, is that, that imitates God's creation most closely, which makes it the most dangerous and um, um, most and, uh, and the worst type of sin, because it most, uh, because it most closely resembles God's uh, good creation. This is Nietzsche's will to power, right? Um, he says that um, th this this tainting, this parasitic like contortion, turns I love this ordered, um, this ordered orientation, to I love myself. He, he says it turns I look for truth into I look for my truth, or I make my own truth. Justice becomes a search for my rights. You notice how everything is turned in on itself. Um, and I think you can see that in abundance in today's culture. That's page 43. He says, It is the greatest of sins to attempt to deceive God himself and wax fat upon his gifts. Um, so he, he uses the Pharisees as an example. Those people whom Jesus is most violently opposed to are those who um, attempt to deceive God himself and wax fat upon his gifts, who claim to follow God's commands um, and who uh, attempt to deceive God and deceive themselves into thinking they are righteous. He concludes this chapter with a new definition of Christian ethics. He says, Christian ethics is that branch of theological wisdom that studies human actions so as to direct them to a loving vision of God, which is complete happiness in our final end. This is done under the impulse of the theological and moral virtues, especially charity and justice, with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It is affected through experiences of the human condition, such as suffering and sin, and is implemented by laws of behavior and commandments, which reveal God's ways to us. Um, he, uh, Pink Air has presented his first definition of Christian ethics um, towards the beginning of chapter 1. Um, and there are very many similarities, but there are also some differences, and I thought it might be helpful to... Um, take a look at those. In the first definition, Christian ethics is the branch of theology that studies human acts, etc. And in this new definition, he says Christian ethics is the branch of theological wisdom that studies human actions. And I think um, this incorporation of that word wisdom is important. It's important that he's added that now um, because of that uh, intuition, that spontaneity that he talks about. Um, it's not just simply in accord with theological teaching, but there's a kind of um, natural inclination towards that, a kind of wisdom that accompanies this, uh, this theological endeavor, right? Um, the rest is very similar up until um, uh, the sentence where he says, this is done under the impulse of the theological and moral virtues. Again, there's an impulse, a kind of draw towards the good that he wants to draw out, which Kantian and modern ethicists tend to ignore. Um, it is affected through the experiences of the human condition, such as suffering and sin, right? So these considerations of moral ethics have to be contextualized in these considerations of suffering and sin, which is what he had talked. There were two sections in this chapter covering the, the, those two things, right? And is implemented by laws of behavior and commandments. So again, commandments, he was critical of these moral systems which, which use the commandments exclusively as a way by which to, to do ethics. But he says by laws of behavior and commandments. So he doesn't dispense with that, again, but he's, he's contextualizing it. And he wants to include behavior too, which is that underlying um, disposition um, and not simply just discrete actions, which reveal God's ways to us. So again, he, he, it's important for him to... Um, to to use scripture, to use revelation um, in this study. So this is 
chapter two of the sources of Christian ethics, 40 minutes long. <laughs> um, join me again for chapter three, and uh, uh, I hope that maybe you'll consider getting the book and reading it for yourself. Thank you.